and good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of Manners and More with Melina. I'm your host, Melina Gay. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And I want to start the show off with a few acknowledgments because generally we lose time at the end. So today we're going to start off with our special acknowledgments. First, I'd like to say thank you so much to you for tuning in today. And today is our 31st episode. And our very special guest today is one whom you will be very, very intrigued by as I'm intrigued by. Before we get into that, I would like to also acknowledge Ms. Donna M. Andrews. You've seen her on several other shows, and she has the beautiful, beautiful artwork. And if you are interested in reaching out to her, her email is dmandrews at msn.com. Or you can always email me at Manners with Melina, and I'll be sure to get the message to her. I would also like to give a special shout out to my cousin Vic Sparrow, who is holding it down with the NASA space program. Good job, Vic. Thanks for tuning in and tell all the family I said hello. I'd also like to acknowledge ECM, the best management team in the absolute world. And also, there's going to be a pink and green celebrity golf classic coming up this Friday on August the 23rd. I'll get back to you with that information in just a moment, but I would like to switch now to our very, very sweet and so precious intern named Ayana. And she has a very, a, a very interesting project that's coming up for Saturday, and she really needs your support. So we're gonna turn the camera over to her and she's going to give you a little bit of information about how you'd be able to support her. Ayana. Um, well, the event um, this Saturday is called the Battle of the Valleys, and it will be at 7 o'clock. It's a $10 entry fee. It is in Granada Hills at the Rage. There is also an event coming up September 1st called the 818 AMAs. Um, it is in Sherman Way. It's in Canoga Park. The address is 21622. And um, basically, you can get tickets um, at the website, flyfirstla.com, or you can contact 424-256-6944. Oh, OK. Well, we thank you for that, Ayana. And Ayana has been here. She's been here every week. And she really takes care of business and gets everything taken care of with the special chairs and make sure our guests are in place. And we want to thank you so much, Ayana, for all your support and for everything you do. And please, please support Ayana. And you said there's a, we there's a website that you can support her with. And we'll ask her to, to repeat it at the end of the show. I'd also like to say hello to our, another one of our fabulous sponsors who comes every single week. And her name is Tamara. And she has the sugar and spiked treats, these lovely treats that she shares with us every week in this wonderful refresh water. Today's water has peaches and limes, and it's just so fantastic. And she provides us, us the guests, and myself with these treats and goodie bags every single week. So I'd like to give her a few moments just to say a little bit about her business. Tamara? Hello. Hello. I'm Sugar and Spiked. If you ever want to try a unique and different type of dessert, then you call. I make everything from cakes to candies to suckers to chocolate, just about everything you need. Um, you can find me on Facebook at Sugar and Spiked, or you can also contact me at 1-800-651-6856. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tamara, and thank you, Cousin Vic, for texting back in and saying that you got your shout out. Thank you so much. Tell the rest of the family I said hello. Well, right now, we are going to acknowledge our very special guest today, whom you may know as best known for his roles as Theodore T.C. Calvin, the helicopter pilot on the long-running television CVS series, Magnum P.I., that ran from 1980 to 1988. He also played the Vietnam War buddy of the lead character, who's, also, who's played by Tom Selleck. Now, you may also know him for, from his role as Coach Ricketts on Hanging with Mr. Cooper, whom he starred opposite Mark Curry and Holly Robinson Pete. Please join me in welcoming the fabulous Mr. Roger E. Mosley to Manners and More with Melina. Thank you so much for joining us today, Roger. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see whether you have me thrown out of here before this is all over. Oh. You used up all my trivia questions. <gasps> what does TC stand for? Oh. All those kind of questions. I See, did. Those, those, I use those at celebrity tennis tournaments and stuff. Yeah. Uh-oh. But hey, if people watch your show, they got to remember. I was going to say, they don't know the answer. Now, when you go to this golf tournament that you're involved with, do they have uh, raffles or uh, auctions to raise money, uh, stuff like that? Well, generally they do. This particular golf 
tournament that's going on this coming Friday. I just found out about it today. And so one of my friends asked me to to share the information. So you're not a host, a master of ceremonies, or for this particular yeah. tournament? No, I'd probably just be one of the celebrity players. Well, see, you got see, you got to you got to use all these people watching your show, so mm -hmm. you can get all this information and say, okay, anybody wants to get this free golf ball set? <laughs> and what does TC or Magnum PI stand for? You know what? That's see, a good you one. Can have your, I had the best time Thank one you. time. I was at a golf tournament, and so I started asking trivia questions. That this was way back in the day when, when me and uh, Richard Roundtree and all of those were really going strong. And so I would ask questions about shaft and stuff like that. And then this little boy came up one time. He said, "Wow, you really are smart." And I said, "Why are you smart?" He said, "You know the answer to all those questions." <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, didn't, I just didn't ask any questions I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> right. So, uh, hey, you know, so you can come off really great. You write all this down, and then you can raffle off stuff. You don't do auctions and stuff? I would do stuff? that. I would, you, I'm, usually, I'm the participant. Actually, I'm always a participant, a celebrity participant in the golf you tournament. Like I've you never can hosted sell them. somebody at a raffle. You know what? And I'm, I am, I do a lot of hosting now. So if anyone would like to hire me as a host, you can please contact ECM Management and make that available. Yeah. But I do do a lot of hosting, and you know, I may add that to my repertoire. Let's get millennia hosting. out. Let's get millennia out there. Hello, hosting what golf tournament. What does millennia stand? That that's a derivative of millennia, millennium. <laughs> So well, you're run number one. It's like you know what I learned today. <laughs> I'm number thirty-one. Number thirty-one in what? Your show. You are. I'm number thirty-one. You are. So if I see you again and you forget, I'm gonna say, "Hey, Melanie, remember, remember number thirty-one? Because by that time you'll be up to number one thousand eighty-two, and you'll be interviewing <laughs> Forrest Whitaker and Oprah Winfrey, and you'll forget about us. But then I'll remind you." Way back, so you had this big studio. In, where are you from? I'm from Maryland. You had this big studio in Virginia. Upper Marlboro, Maryland. All right, you want the whole state. All right. <laughs> we give you had this studio in Maryland. I tried to put her in Virginia somewhere, big enough, but she wanted to get out of Marlboro. She went to Virginia, and then you'll be there and you'll forget, and you'll have, you know you'll be like Oprah and stuff, and you I won't even be able to get in, and I'll just say, tell us number thirty one, and it says, what's your name? Mark. I said, me, it's me and Mark and Ayana. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring her back down to earth. And the lady with the good water. <laughs> and the lady with the See, good water. The lady with the good water, and you won't be able to hide your past. It's, oh, man, the studio. It'll be us. So. Well, you know, my friends are always my friends. Well, how do you get millennia? That's 100. Well, you know, actually, my name is Melina. It's, uh, and that is a derivative of my mother's name and my father's name. So she wanted your name? M-I-L-L-E-N-A. Well, then who put the other L in there? Well, I'll tell you how that happened. It's you wanted more, just like you wanted Virginia to go <laughs> from Maryland, from Virginia to Maryland. Well, you couldn't just have one L. <laughs> You have just had L's. to have a couple of L's because you're a hundred times better now than when you started. And there it is. I'm it's feeding you all this stuff, ain't I? I like it. I like it. Are you it. related to Marvin Gaye? No, I'm not. No. No. Not that I know of. Now, my father did say that we were related, but... Well, wait a minute. Your, your dad lied to you a lot? He's passed away. But did your, did your dad lie to you a lot? No, no. I'm a dad. <laughs> I would hate it if your dad told you. <laughs> Then it could. Can you sing? It's quite possible. Actually, I'm singing at a funeral tomorrow. I'll be singing the Lord's Prayer at a funeral. So tomorrow. you can sing. Yes. Your last name is Gay. Yes. Your dad said you're related. Yes. And right now you're sitting there going, "How in the hell did this interview turn <laughs> exactly from about me, me interviewing him <laughs> to him interviewing me?" Yes. How did that happen? <laughs> you're right. good. Because of the way you end up interviewing me. Mm -hmm. Which we won't go into. <laughs> yes, we don't need to. Yeah, everyone need doesn't to need to know that, how that happened. All right, all right, all right. At Mavericks Platt, we won't talk. A whole lot. About I ain't too proud to beg, but we'll go on. <laughs> all right, what you want to know? What you got me on your show for, oh, woman? Roger, because yeah, what's up? you gave me a hard time about not inviting you. That's no, why. No, I did not give you a hard you time. Did. You, you, you said, said I didn't invite you. You walked you up. No, see, not. now you should have left it alone. Because uh -oh, you never get in an argument with a man who gets paid to talk for a living. <laughs> Because you'll never win. She walked up to me and said, some, no, she didn't walk up to me. I walked into this function where they were honoring the guy from The Temptations. And so there were a lot of celebrities in there. And this guy I used to play tennis with, uh, who was a friend of Reggie Theus, who was a basketball player, played professional basketball. And so he came and said, I want to introduce you to my friend. He's a nice looking woman, a young lady. And I said, hey, hey, hi, how you doing? Now, he should, she should have figured out that he was introducing me to her for a reason. 
unbeknownst to me, I just thought he, he was trying to let her know he knew somebody in there because she's a good-looking woman with him. You know, uh, I said, why is she with me? I want to let her know why. No, so anyway, no she said hi. And then I proceeded to go back and sit down, and there were very few people in there. So she came that way, and she proceeded to tell me about her radio, radio show or television show. And I've interviewed Fred Williamson and, 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 and Denzel Washington <laughs> and Holly Berry and so on. And told me a whole list of people she'd interview, and that she was going to interview a whole bunch more. And the implication was... Too bad you didn't have anything going for you. I might have interviewed you. So I just sat there, and I felt all insignificant and everything. Oh. And so we went. The whole night went until I ended up on stage introducing all these people. And somebody must have said, you know who that is. Later on, she goes, you know, uh, I want you to feel welcome to come. I said, oh, before, you had no time for me. <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, you know, you don't go telling somebody else about all the other great people you met and then don't invite them. No, see, what happened was. What had happened what was. What happened was. Anytime a black person <laughs> uses the word had in a sentence, they lying. No. You watch Judge Judy or any other show, and if they say it, if they say the word had, well, see, what happened, he had my, and once they say that, they're lying. No, what she happened? Said, what had happened no, was what really happened was I trying was trying to avoid the word "had," ain't you? <laughs> I was going to invite you, but then Scotty from the Whispers came in, and I needed to talk to him. And Kiki Shepard came in, and she's planning on being a guest on the show, and I need to talk to her. Name dropping. Hit his and name dropping. I'm just saying. And then Oba Robertunde walked in, and then he had. Oh, that's exactly what I observed. What? And I had to go talk to them as well, and uh, then you just uh, disappeared. Uh, you know, so Roger, you grew up in Los Angeles, California. I sure you did. did, didn't you? I sure you did. You were raised by your beautiful mother, Eloise. That's right. Yes, that is Eloise correct. Harris, and, and you grew up in Watts. That's and right. So, and you founded the Watts Repertory in 1974. That is so mm -hmm. phenomenal. Congratulations. Yeah, the name to was you. called Mafundi Rage. Mafundi Rage. Yeah, Watts Repertory Company, Mafundi Institute. Mafundi Rage. Oh, that wow. was our that was our guerrilla theater group. We actually would go out on the street mm -hmm. and do guerrilla theater. Otherwise, you could be standing at a bus stop, uh -huh. and a group of actors would just come out on the street and do a skit. Maybe a skit about police brutality. Maybe a skit about uh, being uh, not treated properly in a restaurant. Maybe a, a, a skit about. Uh, your food stamps not being accepted. They were all. They weren't all tragic. Some of them were really funny. Some of them were about you know food stamps that were so wrinkled. The lady at the cash register couldn't figure out. You know money can get wrinkled and they'll take it. Okay. Food stamp get wrinkled. See the lady over there. I don't know. Uh, what's her name again? Tamara. Tamara. Tamara knows what I'm talking about. Tamara. Food stamps get wrinkled. They give you a hard time. See Did you wouldn't they? know about that. I don't know. Miss One Hundred. So anyway, <laughs> so that we did guerrilla theater, and our uh, our name was um, Fundy Rage. We performed all over the all over the city, uh, UCLA, everywhere. And we were invited to UCLA. We didn't do guerrilla theater there, but we had a nice group of plays that we did in repertoire. Oh wow! So what now? Where did the name Fundy? Send me to throw that big word out there. Repertoire. 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 Repertory theater. Yes, yes, yes. We were in repertoire. Well, that is wonderful. All that right. is wonderful. Now, where did how did you come up with the name of Fundy Theater? Because the place was previously named one of the, th there was the, uh, 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 the Mafundi Institute was the name of the building, mm -hmm. and inside was the Watts Repertory Theater. Ah, okay. See? So, okay. so uh, Mafundi was another word, which I won't go into right now because we'll be here another hour about that. <laughs> but it's very positive. Okay. Very positive, very positive. Okay. Well, good. But that's how that came about. Well, now, when did you know that acting was what you wanted to do, and how did your mother, <coughs> who was raising you, how did she take that, that that's what you wanted to do? Well, acting was the furthest thing from my mind. I was born here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to make money shining shoes. I used to shine shoes downtown L.A. Oh. And uh, there was this gas station that had a shoe shine stand. I was about 11, 12 years old, had a shoe shine stand at a car wash in Studio City. And a lot of my older friends I went to high school with, too, 
they worked at this car wash. When they got 17, 18 seniors in high school, they got cars and they were able to drive out to Studio City. Mm -hmm. I was in the middle school part of the grade, and so I didn't have a car. But the word went out that they needed somebody to shine the shoes out there. So mm. I rode with them out there on Saturdays and Sundays and shine shoes at this little stand. This little real stand was set there. I used to shine shoes with my little shoe box, get on the train, go downtown and shine shoes. So I went down there and I started shining shoes. And I, it was in Studio City, right off of Ventura and Laurel Canyon. And I shined shoes of uh, Lon Chaney, Bella Lugosi, a lot of big uh, movie stars at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. I said that to say I was around, I was born here. So okay. uh, like, like, like when you're around something, you don't get engaged in it. Right. Like, I think I was the last person to go to Disneyland. People were flying in from all over the place to go to <laughs> Disneyland. I could get on the freeway and drive right down there in 20, 25 minutes, but I was probably the last person to go because, you you know, sometimes you don't take advantage of what's right there. Exactly. So since I was around it, the thought of me being one never crossed my mind. Plus the opportunities for African Americans mm -hmm. wasn't there. I was still part of the group that grew up going, Mama, Mama, there's a black man on television. There's a black woman on television. Everybody run in the house, and we look for a black person. Maybe Harry Bella finally to sing one song or something, mm -hmm. and we just be so excited. And they would sing one song and get off. Okay. So now comes this period of time when the transition took place. Mm -hmm. And here's how I got into the business. In the process of doing this guerrilla theater and making our expression, this is in 65 after the social unrest in Watts, not a riot. Okay. It was not chaotic. If you look up the word riot, it was very chaotic. If you had been in Watts, you saw some buildings burn, some buildings didn't. Mm. right next door to each other. Some places got vandalized, some places didn't. Hmm. So it was very structured. It wasn't chaotic. Oh. They knew who they wanted to get. We knew who we didn't like. Oh, okay. <laughs> we knew who we didn't like okay. and who had to be eliminated. Had to be eliminated. Had to be eliminated. Okay. Had overstayed their welcome. Okay. So anyway, uh, that being the case, we had developing the self-expression as it happened all over the United States in the 60s. We had just gotten tired. We were at that period. I went and saw this movie, um, uh, The Butler. Mm. And if you want a reference to what I'm talking about, look at The Butler, and then you'll see the part that his son was involved in, the latter part. That's, that's the part that we were involved in, where he said, we just got tired of getting beat up. We, the Martin Luther King thing wasn't working. We started fighting back. Oh. So we started fighting back. Okay. So at any rate, I never forget, so we, we, we got this theater workshop, and uh, this lady named Nina Foch, you know, almost white entertainers out there will recognize that name, came in and held a little seminar at Mafundi Institute, and she made a very interesting statement. She said, if you feel you have something to say, uh -huh. acting, filmmaking, Entertainment is the best platform to say it on. It's people all over the world have forgotten who, at that time, Khrushchev was the leader of the Soviet Union. They have forgotten half the presidents of the United States. Mm. But everybody knows Clark Gable. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows Marilyn Monroe. Everybody knows uh, Joan Crawford. In, in, even at this stage, yeah. I, you see my man over here is looking. He, uh. Those names resonate with them. And people will listen to those people. So if you have yes. anything you want to say, film and television is the best way to say it. it is. And I went, huh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so I started investing in my acting and got in acting workshops, theater workshops. And my mother, who had worked as a day laborer, the, move, the movie The Maid, The, the Help, rather, the could have been made about my mother and my grandmother. Really? That's what they did. They were domestics. We we moved up from maids to domestics. Oh, domestics. Yeah, okay. domestics. Okay. From garbage men to, um, what, what was the word we use now for garbage men? Um, it'll come to me in a minute. Okay. But at any rate, uh, that was the last thing she thought would happen. She knew I was doing plays. Mm -hmm. She knew that was better than what I was doing because I was very, very active. I was very active in the resistance in Los Angeles. Uh, what, like sit-ins, marches, things like that? So you went Yeah, I was a lecturer. I was a lecturer. And I got in trouble with the FBI when I crossed state lines. And I lectured over at uh, uh, 
Arizona uh, uh, University of Arizona, Arizona State University, when I went over there and lectured. Uh, that's when the FBI got on my tail. So I, How long I, ago was that? Are they looking? In the 60s. Oh, okay. In the so 60s. We're, we're good now? Good here? Heck no. Haven't you read where <laughs> this boy Snowden is, is in now because they're watching everything we do? Yeah, oh, you are, that's true. No, I mean, millennia, I, we, we're okay. you are under radar <laughs> because you have an audience. So it can be monitored what you say to your audience. You don't know that? I do now. <laughs> you didn't know? This whole I, group. I had an idea. You... You're going out. Now, so far, you're a nice young lady. Well, thank you so, very hey, much. They, no, no, we ain't talking about what I'm saying to you. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is you're a nice young lady. Your whole little group here, you're just interviewing, talking about manners and stuff. As soon as you get political, you can rest assured. And you can't be afraid of that. I mean, if you I'm, have, not, I'm not afraid yeah, of it. You, 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 you can't be afraid of that. But thank you for letting me know what's in store. So, so as soon as I get political, what happens? As soon as you get political, at <laughs> first was this, this was not, I asked, what is Melania? Manners and Melania and she was endorsing uh, uh, John McCain. Huh? Oh, really? Okay. What else she say? Ah. So you, 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 once you turn political or subversive, you know, uh -huh. uh, I think uh, uh, Zimmerman should be. Uh, <laughs> Taken back to court. Oh, oh okay. Well, let's listen. Let's hmm. listen. Hmm. So it's more widespread. See, it's, it's it's more widespread. But people you like you who have an audience, they're interested in what you have to say. And then if you continue on and say, I think uh, Zimmerman should be brought in uh, because I heard that uh, uh, he, he didn't wash his hands before he <laughs> ate. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. That yeah. is, that is um, you know, we're going to take a quick break and be right back because I'm going to do some investigation. Yeah, sure mention the FBI. She's she ready for a break, right, y'all. Let's look She's ready for a break now. <laughs> Come back. I might be the only one sitting here. <laughs> we'll be right back with more Manners and More with Molina with Roger E. Mosley. <laughs> And we're back with Manners and More with Melina with the incomparable Mr. Roger E. Mosley. Roger, that, yeah. was, that was something else. That was absolutely something else. Um, so, now, a lot of people don't know this, but you're also an accredited director and writer, having served in both capacities on the Magnum PI series. Mm -hmm. Now, can you share with us what was that experience like? Now, you were on the show from 1980 to 1988. So just you, being an African-American on a show such as that for eight seasons was outstanding. But to have, you, to have the opportunity to actually direct and write episodes, I mean, that was pretty much unheard of, especially during that time. So how did, how did, how did you get that gig? Um, uh, what does this say? The necessity is the mother, the of, mother invention. of invention. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, 
You know, when you get in a position where you're smarter than the people you're working for, it's kind of frustrating. Yes, it is. Ooh, I hit a nerve there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I hit a anyway, nerve ooh, there. I'm so, mm, anyway, what this is about. And this. people have a tendency, especially if you're black, to relegate you into a level of being thankful that you're even there. Mm-hmm. Let alone have an opinion. Exactly. So it got to the point that when they wrote this, see, first of all, this character on Magnum P.I. was not designed to be a black character. Washington. It was designed it's to be. In fact, the guy division. who played Major Dad, Gerald, Rain, Gerald McRaney, had the role. And when they looked at the role, they had Gerald McRaney. I don't know whether you remember him. Uh, I, I did Roots, and in Roots, he played my slave owner. So I got to know him. Good guy. Good mm. guy, you know. Uh, I'm going to make a point, too. The more diabolical race-baiting, hate-mongering character you have in a movie and television, he's usually one of the nicest white guys you ever want to run into mm -hmm. because they have to be that kind of person to take the role. Right. And then they'll take the role because, you know, everybody on the set is behind them, knowing they have to go to that level. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, like the guy in 42, the Jackie Robinson story, that yeah. taunted the Jackie Robinson character. Whoopi Goldberg made it a point on The View to say how really a nice guy he is. But somebody had to play the role. Why not get a guy who is acting the role as opposed to... Who really is. Really guy. is the character, but is a good enough actor to make you believe it. So then you don't go around and see the guy on the street and cuss him out. But, <laughs> so Gerald McRaney was one of those type of guys. Played a good role. He and I, you know, I, I admire his acting and stuff like that. But anyway, he was supposed to be TC and Magnum P.I. Oh. And the producer just pretty much looked at that and said, what's wrong with this picture? So they had John Hillerman, Tom Selleck, Larry Manetti, and Gerald McRaney. Hmm. <laughs> Four white guys in Hawaii. Hmm. So they said, we had to color this up. <laughs> right, just, just something. <laughs> we have to color this up. But the only problem was Hawaii Five-0 and Aloha Hawaii and all those other shows had used up, because it's only a small place, mm -hmm. had basically used up all the good Hawaiian actors there were. Oh. You know, it just, I mean, we're not saying that there weren't any others that could, but just for that particular role. Uh -huh. So they said they had to get some color. And Tom Selleck had done a movie with me that he said, I know a guy and he's working like mad and he, he doesn't want to do a TV series and maybe we can talk him into it since I know it. And his name is Roger E. Mosley. And, and, and they said, well, fine, can you call him? And so they called my agent. My agent called me and I told my agent I didn't want to do a series because I didn't want to do anything that I had to get up every morning. <laughs> I was doing good, making movies. You work for six or seven months. You make a whole lot of money. Uh -huh. And then the rest of the year, you're off. You, you spend can go it. spend your money yeah, and have a good time. And so he said, look, it's with this guy, Tom Selleck. Mm -hmm. He's done a ton of pilots. None of them have sold. And I just got off doing two movies back to back, The River Niger and uh, Stay Hungry. And I was flying from Alabama playing this really self-effacing really Uncle Thomas black guy, mm. and then flying back to Los Angeles and playing this militant rebel that was taking over the city, which is what the River of Niger is about. And so I just about used all of my acting range. And I would fly back from Birmingham, Alabama to play this character, fly back from L.A. to play that character. And then he literally said, you've been working hard, you'll go to Hawaii, they'll pay a lot of money, the series won't sell, this guy never sells a series. Mm. And you can relax and have a good time. Okay. Get a tan. Yeah. Tell him I didn't need a tan. He <laughs> said, well, take the money. So, so I did. Okay. Well, eight and a half years later, <laughs> we're eight still in Hawaii. <laughs> so at any rate. Uh, still getting up early, going to work. Yeah. And hmm. so that's what they said. And that's how I and that's how I ended up doing that role. Now, in the middle of all that, since they hadn't planned on me, when they wrote the character, to show you how the problems we the problems we had, the very after we shot the pilot, now we're the pilot so right away. Pilot so right away. So let's start making plans, start moving everybody to Hawaii. You're gonna go. And they said, okay, your character T C is this poor broke guy who's got this little broken down helicopter business and Tom Selleck keeps he has to keep doing things for Tom Selleck. For, for Magnum mm -hmm. in order to survive. You know, he, okay. he, that's how he keeps getting in all these scrapes. And I just looked at him and said, I am not going to be the only black guy on this show and be broke. Right. Uh -uh. I said, I'm just not going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And they said, well, what? I said, you know, 
I, I'll be the guy that keeps falling, but I'm not going to be the only black person on this show and be poor. Mm-hmm. And it worked out. Good. It so you worked stood, out. You stood your ground. Good for but you. But that's as far as they got. I went four years and never had a girlfriend. I said, is my character gay? I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, just tell me, you know. I mean, what, what is it? They made no reference to my family. Everybody else's character grew. Mm-hmm. grew. I mean, Tom's a star of the show, so quite naturally his background mm-hmm. is going to be covered. John Hillerman's character developed so many ways that he played five or six different characters. Even Larry Manetti's character had somebody, mm-hmm. and they had just run out of things to do. Mm. So one of the guys said, I'll think of writing something for you. My kids used to come visit me in Hawaii, and I remember one time they came to visit me in Hawaii, and they had these little trams that go from the airplane to the main terminal. They call them little wiki wiki buses. Okay. Anybody who's been to Hawaii, you'll know what mm-hmm. I'm talking about. I've been, I, yeah. And nobody asked you where you've been. <laughs> well, we, we I know have you've been, been everywhere. <laughs> we'll we'll get back to you later. <laughs> I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna interview you. People oh. want to know about you. No, they don't want to. They yes, want to know about do. you. Uh, I said <laughs> I'm gonna come back and interview you after we get through with me because they want to know about you. But anyway, in the process <laughs> of bringing these wiki wiki buses, which is about a half a mile ride from the airplane. I walked to the airplane, and they came on the bus, so we missed each other. Mm -hmm. And so for a minute there, I said, well, I'm standing there waiting on my kids to walk down the walkway from the plane, and everybody else got off, and my kids didn't show up. And the lady said, they saw them, and I said, well, where did they go? And for just about, I'm talking about maybe two minutes, nobody knew where they were. And then a minute later, said, oh, the flight attendant put them on the Wiki Wiki bus, and they went down there. And so they went, and they were down there. Oh, okay. But I said, whoa, whoa, there's a story. Where's TC's kids? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, I, that's the one. story I wrote. And the yeah. story was is that to get something out of me mm-hmm. and Tom Selleck, they kidnapped my kids. So that's how I end up writing on Magnum. Oh. Now the part okay. about so necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. It became necessary for me to expand my character. Why didn't I do it myself? Exactly. Then about the story about working for people who you know more than, after you do a hundred and something shows, you start to know how a show goes, plus all the movies and things I had done. Mm-hmm. But you have directors coming over there first, second time directors. They only direct two or three shows. And all of a sudden, they feel a need to direct you, like, stand <laughs> over there. And you're at the stage, you're going, why would I stand over there when you're never going to move the camera? Right. When you're never going to move, why don't I stay here? Right. Or they would say, oh, oh, here's why they say stand over there. We're already lit over there. Well, why are you lit over there? Right. Because we already lit Tom. Well, you can't use the same light to light me that you lit Tom. Right. Yes, you can. The first 50 shows, they could sell me on that. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting on television, and the camera shoots over me. I look like an olive in a bowl of milk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in the dark. No, you got to relight. Yes. So then when you get to the point that you're telling directors, I can't stand over there, you get the reputation of being obstinate and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But you're also at the point that, I know that's right. Right. I know that's right. Exactly. And when you can get the producer who says, who turned out to be, be black, Charles Johnson, mm-hmm. when I had white producers, they didn't understand. They didn't get it. When Charles was there, he understood. He said, you got to light him. Uh-huh. You got to take the time to light him. Yeah. And when they took the time to light me, yes. that's when I knew I need to direct some of these myself. Yeah. I can do this. <laughs> and I did. And the show came out in the top ten. Shows I did end up in the top ten of, for the week. Wow. So there. Wow. That's fantastic. Now, everybody out there is going to fall asleep. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Our technician is here talking louder than I am. <laughs> Sound like a guy in the back of the theater that keeps talking through the movie. <laughs> you are a card. You are an absolute card. Now... Um, so you you were saying that the shows that you wrote and directed there ended up in the though, top ten. Hmm? Uh, I'm an absolute car, but you're having fun, though, ain't you? I, you know what? This <laughs> this this show is definitely one for the record books. This mm-hmm. is definitely <laughs> one. And like no, no, no. <laughs> it, it happens. You know what? If we could run the clip of Magnum PI, that introduction that just keeps going through my head, everybody not remembers this show. And if you don't, take a look at this, and you will see why. It's not eight, eight seasons.
Oh, did you see the helicopter? Oh. At the very beginning, that helicopter, uh-huh. I just came back from Hawaii two months ago. They rebuilt it. Oh, really? They rebuilt it. The exact same specification, everything, and I went and relaunched it. Oh. I went and relaunched it in Hawaii uh, two months ago. So, there you are, right there. Yeah. There you yeah. are. Yeah. There you are. Look at you. And see, I pulled this. Uh, this is actually in French, this intro. Just, and I did it on purpose because it shows that the you had international acclaim. You speak French? No, I speak Spanish. I studied that at the University of Virginia. Look What's your that. ethnic background? What, 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 how did millennia gay come to be? <laughs> Roger, I am African American 100% no, despite the... No, you're not. No, you're the... not. See, that, that's the same problem I had with Roots. <laughs> they took Leslie Uggams... <laughs> Put her with Chuck Connors, a white man, and Leslie Uggam is your your tone, and come up with Ben Vereen. Leslie Uggams is my tone? Yes. Okay. She played my wife on Magnum, so I know. Okay. Well, first of all, they took two pure Africans, okay. John Amos and Madge Sinclair. You remember okay. those two actors? Yes, yes. Two pure Africans and came up with Leslie Uggams, who looks like you. Woo. That's those are white people casting the show. But you know, then they took Leslie Uggams, <laughs> who looks like you, and Chuck Connors, and came up with Ben Vereen. <laughs> Come on. Well, you know, there are no, not pre African, <laughs> not straight from Africa. You, you, you been okay. to Africa? I have not been to Africa yet. Baby, let me tell you something. Go to go to go to London. I have been to London. I've been to London. Have you seen some of the Africans in London? I have. Then you know why black people are called black people. Yes. And why white people are called white people. Because <laughs> when you've seen a person that's from white. London that's been raised there and all that cloudy rain, they are the white. These white people we got, they ain't real white people. <laughs> they, they ain't real white people. London got some white people. They do. They do. People they call do. themselves African Americans here. They're because it's coming. African Americans. Because they look African part. Ain't nothing compared to some black people. <laughs> The Africans that straight from the continent, you know why they're called white and we're called black. But now I have to interrupt you and disagree with that a little bit because okay, one of my dear bit. friends is Nanjabulo Langwa. She mm-hmm. is from South Africa and she's the chief of the Zulu nation. And actually she and I are the same complexion. There's a whole tribe that's your color. Yeah, there's, there's a whole the, tribe of she, Africans that is your color. And what's, but they, not the not the not the two Africans they brought for roots. <laughs> not those. They're, they're, that's not your tribe. <laughs> that wasn't your tribe. There is a whole tribe of Africans. Yeah, I've done my research. Uh huh. Yeah. So if you came from that tribe, that is your pigmentation. Mm-hmm. They look. They 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 are your color. A little more red than you. Mm hmm. But no, not uh, not not uh, Jar- not John Amos and Mass and Claire colored <laughs> Africans. So you don't get two Nigerians and come up. <laughs> right. Come up with Leslie Huggins. I don't right. care what you do. <laughs> All right. We, well. we, we can debate this forever, but yes. I'm going to be right on this but, one. But we are going to move on, and okay. we are going to take a quick break, and we will be right back with Roger E. Mosley. You stay tuned.
Hey, and we're back with Manners and More with Melina with the very special Mr. Roger E. Mosley. So now, Roger, your career has spanned almost four decades. And so your most prominent role to date, well, one of them was your 1976 starring turn as the title character in Lead Belly, which was directed by Gordon Parks. Now, I have Senior. seen... Gordon Parks Sr. stand corrected me. Now, you've guest starred on several shows such as Night Court, Starsky and Hutch, Kojak, The Rockford Files, Beretta, okay, yeah, get comfortable, Beretta, Sanford and Son, You Take the Kids, and oh, The do, District, you don't have to go through all and the most just recently, a lot of the them. Showtime adult series, Rude Awakening. Now, you also had a role in Roots the Next Generation that we just talked about, and you also made memorable appearance in the 1973 film, The Mac. Now, as the militant brother of the main character, Goldie, and played Officer Roy Cole alongside Kurt Russell and Ray Liotta, in Unlawful Entry. Did we know that? Yes, we did. Now, you also played opposite Patrick Swayze in Letters from a Killer. He played opposite Dolph Lundgren in Pentathlon and opposite Denzel in Heart Condition. You had roles in the films Zora Is My Name, Thin Line Between Love and Hate, and you also appeared in season five of Las Vegas as the billionaire friend of Montecito owner A.J. Cooper, also played by who? Longtime friend Tom Selleck. Oh, my goodness. So, Roger, with yes. all of that, <laughs> I'm sorry, am I boring you? No, uh -uh. That, that <laughs> You're was folding not, paper. That, I, 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 was, I was acting embarrassed. <laughs> Don't act embarrassed. You have, you've done this for 40 years, and you've done it very, very well. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what was your first major role that would, would you say changed your life and changed your career? Lead belly. Lead belly. Now, why so? Because... They, I, I don't like the phrase black movies. It was a long time we called it, oh, was it a black movie? It was a black movie. No other movie had a color. Mm. There weren't white movies for white people or black movies for black people or brown movies for Latino people or yellow movies for Asian people. Nobody had a movie but a color movie but us. And it, because it was a code word for low budget. Oh. And so, and then there were low budget and the concept the theme the directors everything when and when it, the editing everything was going to were not controlled by black people hmm. so the product that came out was somebody's concept of how we acted and what we did mm -hmm. uh, broad scope of everything but i must admit when i did lead belly it's the first time that i could actually say i felt that i was in a black movie it was about a character a black man that actually lived which I've been very fortunate. I've done about eight movies of actual black people mm. that actually lived. And uh, uh, from Maya Angelou's dad, which nobody knows anything about except me. Mm. Um, I could just name the, the other seven, but I won't. I'll go on. But that movie, everybody who spoke to me was black. Mm. The director, Garden, was black. The first assistant director, Ruben, was black. The second assistant director was black. The head of wardrobe was black. The head of makeup was black. And these Ooh. were all Emmy-winning women wow. and, and men. People, wow. and that's the first time I had that opportunity. And when I would go on the set, I was constantly correcting directors because I even had a director one time ask me to use a phrase and I said, I never heard that before. And he said, well, a black guy told me that's the way y'all say it. I said, I'm black, and I ain't never heard it before. <laughs> how, you, how you want me to say something I never heard right. before? It was some little catchphrase, and I refused to say it. And he called a producer over, and the producer came over, and the producer said, hey, that's why we hired him. I can't listen to you. And the white guy was the writer. Right. But he could not back that up. All other black people said, we never heard this phrase before. So at any rate, I was constantly having, waging those battles. I used to call myself the Malcolm X of actors because I was constantly waging battles like that one about we're not going to be poor and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. It made me seem to be cantankerous, but it made it easier for the next person coming along because they just didn't think they could run things past us. And we appreciate that. Thank you. So, yeah. Well. <laughs> so at any rate, when I would get on the set and I would say, well, I don't know, Garden could look at me and say, I knew Huddy led better. I know his auntie, and you can just go over there and sit down and do the scene. 
And I looked at him and I looked around and I didn't have to question everybody about the wardrobe because you know how they did all those quote old black movies, putting these big pimp hats and all mm-hmm, that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. big pimp, pimp outfits. Everybody drove the same pimp car. They had right. a one pimp car. They used it in five different movies. <laughs> it got to be the pimp car. The pimp car. But because everybody I dealt with and I knew the wardrobe people were dealing with the period and I knew the hair person was dealing with the period, I could finally just relax and act. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to think anymore. Mm. I, I didn't have to challenge anybody. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to look out for myself. They looked out for me. And that, to me, was the first black movie mm-hmm. that was ever produced because the director was black, the assistant system director was black, the people who put the clothes on me was black, people put the, the makeup on me was black. There was black stuff there for me. Mm. In the makeup department, wow! There was some Murrays. Actually, there was some Murrays in the hair. What? I'm lying about that, but oh, I'm okay. making my point. <laughs> Did you have a do rag and a stocking cap? Going? Yeah, yeah. If I needed, they had. I wouldn't have to explain what a do rag was. Right. I could have said, "Do we have a do rag?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, right over here. You know, I mean, wow. that allowed me to not just think about the character, and I think it showed up in the movie. Mm. Everybody has seen the movie has said, "Wow, you really did a great job," and I said to them. Wow, I was finally able to just act. That's a luxury that white actors always have. Yeah. They always have that. Mm -hmm. I had never had that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of fellow actors said the same thing. Have you had it since then? No, no. But my fellow actors have. I think that's the privilege that Forrest and them had Mm -hmm. in this movie. Okay. Uh, The Butler. Yes. Because uh, Lee Daniels. Being black, you know, surrounded them yes. with, with, with people. And so you get movies like Precious and stuff like that where where there's no second guessing. You, mm-hmm. You're able to let yourself go. Yes. And in order to be that good actor, you have to have that opportunity to let yourself yeah, go. You have to have that support system who allows you to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you um, now. I know that you will be, on August 24th, you will be directing a Reader's Theater for Playwright, Felton Perry, mm-hmm. and his play, The Reverend's Good Wife, That's at right. the Vision Theater in Lemert Park. Now, what inspired you to become involved at with this? At 3 o'clock on at, Saturday. Oh, please, let's tell it all. Tell yeah, it all. At 3 o'clock Saturday, August 24th. It's a small seating space, so get out there early. We might, you know, get out there early. There's not a lot of seats, but come down there and have a good time. It's a play reading. Okay, so I was going to say, please tell everyone what it, what it's about and what made you decide to get involved with that. Well, it was for the NACP where they're having Black uh, Theater Festival Week uh, that that week, and they're going to do a lot of projects. They're going to have some award shows and things like that. It doesn't give enough time. They don't have the funding and the time to mount an actual play. They were giving awards to plays that have been put on by groups predominantly black or Latino, any groups of color, National Association for the Advancement of colored people, not mm-hmm. black people. Right. So it would involve all theater pieces of color. It can be Asian, black, and Latino. But they wanted to put something on at the Vision Theater, mm-hmm. and they didn't have the budget to actually put this play together. But they did have the budget. For, well, we're really putting the money in ourselves because we want to give the NAACP something, and we're going to give them a reader's theater. The, the actors will read from the script, but it's a great experience because mm-hmm. they really dramatize the play reading. It's going to be kind of like in the old days. You're too young to remember this, but when you used to have to sit down and listen to Amos and Andy on the radio. See, I, I'm oh. old enough to remember that. Okay. But you're not. But the point is it could be very entertaining, hmm. very entertaining. So it's a chance for you to hear a good play. Oh. Felt this prayer, phrase play is very good. Now, what, what made you decide to do to get involved with that particular play? Because they asked me. Because they oh. asked me. Oh, okay. That's Sometimes it's just that simple. Sometimes when you try, when people need help, don't make it hard for them to ask you. Just you know, like if they want you on your show, don't you made it, it hard. Don't, for don't, me don't to make ask. it hard for the person to say yeah. Line them up when you got them. Well, I'm just going to tell you, I told Della Reese on you. I told her that you gave me a hard Della time. Della Reese loved I, me. I, I, well, I told her that you hurt my feelings. I hear the and sound of music. And she told me, music. don't worry about it. Della, Della Reese loved me. <laughs> she does, but I was upset and I told on you. And she said, don't mm-hmm. worry about it. So, now, a l- little bit more about the NAACP. At NAACP Theater Festival, they have, they have forged an exciting array of activities in order to showcase the talents of African-American per- 
participating in the Los Angeles theater community. Now, their mission is to highlight the talent, genius, and artistry of performers, directors, and playwrights who've contributed to the arts and culture of Los Angeles. Wait a minute, so. there's one more, because you're going kind of slow. Plus, if you just want to meet with me and find out about this industry, want to know more of my experiences, on Sunday yes. at 1 o'clock, yes. At the uh, William Pulliam Theater, which is on the corner of 43rd and Degnan. Yes. I'll be there talking for entertain anything you want to know about the business. Come to that meeting. I got answers. You got questions. I got answers. Got Workshops where you need to go, what you need to look out for, how to prepare yourself for the industry you're trying to get into. Come back Sunday. That's right down the street from the Vision Theater. So if you just hang around in the Lamert Park area, you're going to see me there. Mm, okay. And your your event is called Conversations with Roger E. Mosley. Conversation. Just like this, you can have a conversation with Roger E. Mosley. Although, mm. you know, unlike poor Millennia, you won't get you, you get a chance to talk back. She, she didn't get it. Right, they got a little note. Really mean? Really mean? Right. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> she, 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 she's sick. A little voice thing wore, wore down. Do you, you got anybody else to talk to after I leave? Yes, my managers. <laughs> We're we'll having a whole long conversation about this. But no more on the show. <laughs> no, the show is over. No, it, we, we'll come back again next week. But right now, I want to congratulate you on your 2009 award. You received TV Land's Classic Television Award at Universal Studios. So congratulations to you for that. Thank you. Now, what I would love to know is, can you explain the significance? What does the TV Land Classic <laughs> Television Award, what does that mean, and how was that experience for you? How did you learn and grow as a person and as an actor? Well, that was, a, that was an award for the show, for all of us, for our body of work, for the show, and its contribution to television. A lot of people, for a lot of people, the show Magnum P.I. is a landmark show. I mean, it was one of the few shows that has something for everyone. It it, it appealed to non-white uh, groups because I was there. I represented the black group. It appealed to the foreigners. You had John Hilleman there for the European group. He played this British guy. We had dogs for the animal lovers. We had the islands for the people who wanted to <laughs> voyeuristically get away from everything. We had the helicopter to show them the island from a different angle than they'd ever seen. And we had Tom Selleck for the women with his dimples. And oh, we had all the girls on the beach for all the guys who wanted to look. That show had everything. Mm -hmm. That show had everything. And plus, we were a good group of guys. Mm -hmm. Now, the award that really, award that really got me is I won a, a, a regional Emmy for a show I did in Atlanta called Run Down the Rabbit. Mm. That was like a kick in the butt at the last minute that I needed because, uh, you know, for a while there, we went through a drought where no actors were receiving any recognition for African-American actors were receiving any recognition for doing anything. Hmm. I mean, it was a big drought. Between Sidney Poitier and uh, Lou Gossett, uh, there was a big, big drought just a big gap between anybody getting recognized, Emmy-wise, or anything. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, I'm so proud of my group that followed the path that some of us laid. Because now, for the first time, you have a movie like The Butler that can say, and with Academy Award nominee so-and-so, with Academy Award winner mm -hmm. so-and-so, with Academy Award for supporting actor so-and-so. And then you set that movie aside, then you go back to another movie that has Viola Davis in it and uh, Terrence Howard in it, and you got Academy Award nominee, mm -hmm. an Academy Award winner, winner. And, Academy, and that's just so great. Yeah. That's just so great to see now that we can fill a movie with people with the word Academy next to their name. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it does, it really, it, as, as a younger person in this industry, I, I mean, I, I hope to last as long as you have lasted and continue to go on. It, it's, so, it's so appreciated, the sacrifices that yourself and your peers have made for myself and my peers in order to have this path. And it is not a, a clear, easy path. It is not. But we appreciate, and I'm speaking on behalf of my fellow actors, we really do appreciate the, the hard way that you, what you suffered and what you had to, to stand on in order so that we could, in order that we have an easier way. So from the bottom of my heart, I really do say thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, um, I have a couple more questions for you. And we have a couple of more minutes left. So just because this is an etiquette show, what topic of etiquette would you like to talk about for two minutes? When is it proper to eat chicken with your fingers? Well, 
Now, see, I have this thing with fried chicken. I've just mm. discovered it. We didn't have it in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Is there I've ever a it. time when it's proper to eat chicken with it? Is there ever a pro- time to eat pro- chicken with your hands? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, there is. Thank you. Okay. Chicken wings, chicken fingers, and they're the, when the little ones are like this, you you have to eat them with your fingers because you can't, the, the fork and the knife, it doesn't work. And it, it make, it's too contrived. I kind of, I, I know the answer, but I didn't answer the question right. Could you, I sh- the question should have been, should you ever be able to eat the chicken with your hand? No, you can never eat it with your hand. Never hold a drumstick up like this. No, no. You should pick it up and eat it, hold it with your fingers. Yes. Any piece of chicken that you can hold with your fingers is proper to eat it with your with your fingers, not your hand. Exactly. You don't pick it up like a Viking warrior. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. if you pick it up and take only enough yes. to bite. Yes, only enough to bite right. and chew properly. That's correct. And never speak with your mouth full. Oh, my goodness. So many people do that nowadays. I don't know. Who you been what dating? is this? What? Who you been dating? <laughs> the, I'm not, ta- I'm not talking <laughs> oh, about ladies and random gentlemen, people. This is a personal experience. You should have seen the look <laughs> on her face. This isn't a personal experience. Somebody broke your heart. You sat there and they just went. They were doing good up till they got to the food, huh? I mean, you know, it was annoying when they took that little piece of bread and was sopping up the stuff on the plate. It was awful. It was so embarrassing. Just so Sop? Uh, sopping. Where you up. learn a word learn a word like sop from I, Maryland? I'm you don't from, know. Maryland oh, is the me. South. Well it's kinda. Yes, it's it's in between. Anyway, took that biscuit and sopped up the the doggone um Sir? salad dressing. Salad dressing? Salad dressing. Yeah. And then clean the entire plate. You never eat everything off of your plate. That makes you look hungry. You, paid you never for have it. A, no, you don't. You leave so a little piece. So licking the plate is out, huh? That is out. <laughs> that is a no-no. That is a negative ever, ever, ever. Roger. Oh. <laughs> okay, enough on the etiquette topic. We have a couple of minutes left. I know that you use your celebrity status for a lot of things, including giving people a hard time, such as myself. Mm-hmm. But you also use it to help raise awareness for youth and education. And since 1969, your favorite philanthropic organization has been the Center for Lifelong Learners in Los Angeles, which is a nonprofit organization that transforms at-risk youth into high achievers. So what made you get involved with that organization, and what are some of the milestones that they they've been able to accomplish since your involvement? Well, it was my wife's organization, but I was, I, in fact, I got her involved with it. it education is the key. Yes, that's, that's a fact. Mm-hmm. Education is the key. And uh, this little organization used to be called uh, Remedi- Remedial Reading and Learning Center. That's when I first got involved with it. Uh, and I would do plays to help raise money for it and things like that. And a lady by the name of Helen Ramey had founded it. And uh, it was, she, she did a very simple thing. She lived in a house, noticed that kids in the neighborhood were having a problem. The teacher were giving them reasons for their problems, learning not to be something that she could put up with. They deemed them uh, inferior mm-hmm. mentally. Set, she felt like they just needed somebody to sit down and spend time with mm-hmm. them. She took kids that were being cast aside, and when she got through with them, they were qualifying to go to college. They were mm. passing the interest exam. Wow. She passed that concept on to my wife. My wife continued on with it. I continued being involved. I was a national spokesperson for the organization, and I would go around and raise funds. A lot of the funds I would raise would be people wanting me to make personal appearances. I'd tell them if they would give an honorarium to a charity of my choice, mm-hmm. and that would be one of the charities, that along with Sickle Cell and uh, Center for Life. And it came to be changed. We changed the name because we're remedial. Mm-hmm started to turn some people away so we changed the name and we moved on from there so anything that has to do with education you can pretty much get me involved wonderful mm-hmm. wonderful thank you roger thank all you right. that's very kind of you you know i'm i'm personally i'm a big education all about education because that's the only way you do better is to know better and the only mm-hmm. way you can know is through education so i completely support you in that and if there's anything that i'm able to able to assist you with with that organization please I, it is my honor to okay. be able to do so so now with that I know aside the, aside from participating in the theater festival this weekend is there anything else that we can see from you and please tell everyone how they can keep up with you and contact you if they wish um. Wow, now you put that right out there. I right sure then, did. Just lobbed you? it on out there. All right, now I'm, <laughs> I, this, this, I'm right now trying to eliminate. I, I made a mistake of having one of the. I'm not computer literate, and so I made a mistake of having one of these, and I won't say what is it, email, something like email, that. Yeah. Man, 
<laughs> I mean, from people I don't even want to know. Oh, I don't Facebook. even know who that. Facebook is that. My daughter put me on this thing. <laughs> and as soon as they made the association that I was the guy from Magnum P.I., it, it's amazing. I mean, some people, I think they have nothing to do but sit there and look for people. And so-and-so says, you would like hopscotch. So-and-so <laughs> says, you like Snickers candy bars, mm-hmm. and you keep getting all of this information to the point that I don't know I don't know how it functions anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm really kind of adverse to giving out any information. I'm right now eliminating things. I know that might sound snobbish or whatever, but if something's coming up, uh, I'll make sure it gets out there. <laughs> <laughs> like this, I'll come on Millennial Show. <laughs> okay, so I tell you what, if you would like to reach Roger. Just please send an email to Manners with Melina, Manners with Melina at Gmail, and I will make sure it gets to you. Okay. How about that? How about now? Is there any other thing that you have coming up or going on? Or no, this is taking is up most of my time okay. right now. I, right around the corner, I was getting chairs and stuff to put this play because, like I said, the NAACP doesn't have any money for this, so we're we're financing our own effort, mm-hmm. but they're providing us with a facility and things of that nature. So I'll see you this Saturday at 3 o'clock yes. for the play, The Reverend's Good Wife. Yes. And then I'll see you again, because I know you're going to make both of them. I'll see you again uh, Sunday at, no, did I get it backwards? Uh, Sunday no, is su- Conversations su- with You. Saturday that's at 1 o'clock. Th- yes. It's at 1 o'clock. Saturday is the play at 3 o'clock. Yes. All right, so come out and have a good time at the play at 3 o'clock Saturday with me, the Reverend's Good Wife, and then Sunday at 1 o'clock, come and let's talk about what you saw Saturday. Absolutely, let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Thank you so and much for being a guest. I'll tell you what millennials today. really like. Okay, we don't need to. <laughs> this is, this is, thank you so much, Mr. Roger E. Mosley, for being a guest today on Manners and More with Melina. And thank you so much for tuning in today, Manners and More with Melina. Very quickly, the sixth annual Pink and Green Golf Classic will be Friday, August 23rd, sponsored by the 20 Pearls Heritage Foundation and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Tau Tau Omega Chapter Charity Golf Tournament is the primary fundraiser for the scholarships at the high school. It will be at Rio Hondo Golf Course in Downey. And you can enter online by going to 6pggolfclassic.eventbrite.com or contact me again at manerswithmelina at gmail. I'll get you all the information. So thanks again to Mark the Engineer. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Mary Sugar and Spiked, Donna Andrews, intern Ayana. Don't forget to support her. And again, thank you for tuning in. I'll see you again next week on Manners and More with Melina. Take care. Bye. Bye.